Good afternoon everyone. I cordially welcome you all for the fourth lecture on the short course on cultural linkage towards Asian ideology. Today we are focusing on India's role in the Asian community. The program for today is such that the lecture is scheduled to be for 45 minutes with a short break of 5 minutes followed by a Q&A session. May I have the honor of introducing our guest lecturer Professor Rahul Raj a lecturer at the Center for Korean Studies, School of Language, Literature and Cultural Studies at the prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru University in India. Our esteemed guest received his Bachelor of Arts, Master of Arts and Master of Philosophy in Korean Studies from the Jawaharlal Nehru University and completed his PhD in Korean Studies at the Hangyang University, Seoul, South Korea. Professor Raj has been awarded numerous awards and scholarships, a few of which are the Korean Government Scholarship, the Outstanding Scholar Award by the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology, Government of Republic of Korea, and the Distinguished Scholar Award for Outstanding Performance in the Y20 on the Line of G20 Summit. Professor Raj has contributed to the field of peace and conflict studies by conducting various research such as North Korea, time to focus on minimalization, not denuclearization, South Korea, the two moons and the future of a nation, and terminal high altitude area defense and South Korea-US-China dynamics. Moreover, he has contributed his boundless knowledge in various opinion editorial articles, such as Could Ban Ki Moon Repeat Kim Dae Jung, Korea's ODA to India, and South Korea India vs. North Korea Pakistan. Sir, we are deeply honored to have you with us here, and we warmly welcome you to deliver this lecture. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for the introduction. I heard a lot about myself. I think I have to do a lot. Uh, anyway, uh, once again, thank you uh, uh, to Professor Hemanta uh, for inviting me uh, for this online uh, lecture session for of this uh, supported by Eurasian uh, uh, Foundation. Uh, it has been an honor to me uh, always uh, to get connected with uh, Sri Lanka and uh, I had a, a good friends when I was a student uh, in, in South Korea. Uh, I had good friends from Sri Lanka. I visited also Sri Lanka in 2018. And uh, unfortunately, due to this COVID-19, where the, our movement has been restricted. So still, uh, we are trying our best to keep our uh, keep the momentum of our networking and all, as well as the academic uh, cooperations, collaborations, uh, in momentum. So once again, thank you. And uh, from now on, I will start my lecture. I have been assigned to uh, present on this topic, India's role in the Asian community. Of course, these days, the uh, cooperation and the Asian community is, uh, is in very much in limelight. And uh, often it is pronounced that as the, the 21st century is the century of Asia. So here, how these Asian countries uh, are going to contribute, not only for the Asian community, but how their contribution, their uh, growth, their uh, prosperity also help the other parts of the world. That's like the uh, global community. So, and what India can play uh, its role uh, in the Asian community and how it will impact uh, at the regional, uh, regional, I mean, in, uh, the Indian subcontinent, but also the Southeast Asia, the East Asia, and the different regions of Asia. So uh, I will focus on, on those uh, uh, parts, okay? So uh, as she has already introduced uh, me, so I don't uh, think uh, there is more to say about myself. Uh, so I'm moving uh, directly to, uh, directly to the presentation, yes. Now, uh, these, these are uh, the, some small facts. Asia is uh, the only, uh, the biggest, I mean, like the uh, uh, region you find in the, and the only region in the world with so much diversity, ranging from uh, religion, uh, race, 
ethnicity, language, uh, and uh, to whom uh, to whom for uh, or for different ideologies as well as different forms of government. So we can see the birthplace of uh, Abrahamic religion like Islam, uh, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, or the natural religions like Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Sikhism, or the different uh, ideologies. Some uh, maybe it may have emerged from the Western countries, but even the Western countries, you uh, uh, we find that no more the adherent of those uh, ideologies. For example, we have the communism, uh, communist system of the government. Uh, we see in North Korea or or in in uh, Vietnam or even China. Okay, uh, the economy or uh, we have this uh, the uh, capitalist system that uh, many countries are uh, following or we have uh, the mixture of uh, communism, uh, socialism, as well as uh, democracy, as well as ca capitalism. So different forms of the governments are, are there, different uh, ideologies are there, different forms of uh, governance uh, 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 you find. So there is a kind of a dictatorship, if you say North Korea, then just opposite of North Korea, uh, there's a, a democratic government, South Korea, or even in our region like India and Sri Lanka, we have a democratic setup of government. So we find so much diversity is there in Asia than compared to any other parts of the world. When we come to race or ethnicity, we have this, in fact, India in, in fact is in itself very diversified country. So we have a different skin color, a different ethnicity, or uh, when it comes to language, so um, uh, you find th uh, thousands of languages in India. Of course, uh, in the official uh, terms, only 28 languages uh, are uh, government considers those 20, 28 languages. But like uh, there are some languages which are uh, spoken by 2,000 people, 3,000 people. So uh, if we count those type of languages or the tribal languages, like for example, near Andaman and Nicobar Island or some other uh, uh, parts. So uh, uh, in India in itself is uh, uh, the uh, home of uh, several languages. Then we move to other parts of the uh, uh, of Asia, like Sri Lanka, Sinhalese, uh, Cambodian, Vietnamese, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and in fact, even if we try to look Russia in uh, geographical terms, even the Eastern part of Russia is part of actually the Asia. Like that's why we say Eurasia for Russia also. And uh, 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 coincidentally, this uh, the program which also supported by Eurasian founders. And so it is, we cannot say only Asia moving also towards the, the uh, European part. Then it comes the Middle East, also uh, Arabic religion, uh, 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 Arabic uh, language, and then the Persian language, Iran, which has its own uh, uh, big history, uh, uh, very strong history of its uh, civilization. Okay, then comes the significance of Asian cooperation lies in the fact that it represents an effort to develop Asian solution to the Asian problem in a cooperative, in a cooperative arrangement. Yes, there are problems. Uh, problems happens in every society. It's not only confined to Asia. It happens to other, uh, every other region. But the biggest problem if we see uh, was the World War II, the, uh, the rise of Nazism in, in Germany uh, in the form of Hitler, so uh, or the uh, Mussolini in uh, Italy. So, but like uh, uh, here also a different set of problems are there. Like uh, for example, uh, the, sometimes the gov government problem, uh, curbing the uh, democratic uh, freedom rights or uh, comes the uh, poverty, which is uh, in, uh, unfortunately it is, is uh, uh, there in a large part of Asia, in, in many Asian countries, or the infrastructural issues, or the territorial disputes, or terrorism, or cyber terrorism. So many things are there, but not necessary. Every problem, if the Western countries have uh, have, have found uh, the solution to uh, to their problem the same solution can be applicable on the Asian countries because a large thing, uh, number of things are uh, very, very different. Give you an example, 
uh, that I used to do when I was in Korea and uh, in even uh, seminars also, that often the scholars cite the example of German unification as an uh, for uh, 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 for uh, as a guidance for Korean unification, North Korea and South Korea. But things are very, very different. German unification is very different and Korean unification would be very different. Both Germans, they fought, uh, 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 both Koreas, they fought a bloody war. Thousands and uh, thousands of millions of people uh, uh, died as well as uh, so many uh, prisoners of war. So many bad, bad things happened. East Germany and West Germany never happened any war. There was no nuclear issue between East and West. The same thing is in Korea, uh, South Korea and North Korea. So if we say this Korean issue, we have to find the Asian uh, uh, way of uh, solution to the problem. When it comes to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, problems, even in India, like the, uh, uh, for example, uh, the India uh, with its own, uh, uh, like fight, fighting against uh, terrorism or Sri Lanka. So, we, uh, people don't need the, uh, the, the Western style. I'm not saying that the Western style is always bad, but you have to understand the characters of the society also. That's uh, just uh, giving the ideologies or given the, even United States took 200 years to elect a black president. So how you can, we can expect a country which is very nascent and, in, and got independence post uh, 19, uh, uh, post World War II can uh, be developed in the democratic setup, just like United States. So we have to find Asian solution to Asian problems. Of course, if the good inputs are there from different parts of the world, it should be uh, incorporated, but also understand the nitty gritty or the culture or the, the uh, or many other things of the, uh, those particular countries. Or as a means, it is, an, it is a strategy to raise the regional collective economic status of these countries from one of dependence on developed country to that of, be, of being equal partners with it, thereby enabling developing countries to dis, demonstrate their power. Yes, why we should be very much dependent on the Western countries? Why not instead uh, better uh, uh, focus on that cooperate with Western countries and uh, in a way that which enable Asian countries to rise and develop and become an equal partner, not a subordinate partner. For example, um, uh, 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 that, uh, which, will give the, which will give the confidence to the new countries also. So it is often said that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, said that 21st century would be an Asian century as no doubt Asian countries have become the growth of global economy. Take for example, Asian countries or Asia uh, post 1945, what was Asia? Nothing was there in Asia. Japan was destroyed, China was not powerful, India was not, India was, has its own uh, uh, colonialism. Many other countries you find, many uh, ASEAN countries also were uh, the same and Middle East were always in the struggle mode. So you find that Asia was nothing. It was a, it was a, continent, a continent of chaos. So people lost hope, but now you see Asia, even Japan, uh, the rise of Japan and uh, the rise of Korea, the rise of China, Taiwan, and the, uh, the rise of ASEAN countries. Now, uh, for example, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, then the uh, rise of India, then uh, the, uh, uh, slowly gra but gradually the rise of Sri Lanka or the Middle East. So many countries are emerging or uh, from, the, uh, from the cahoots of what you say, poverty or underdevelopment, less of infrastructure and all these things. And these countries are somewhere becoming the growth of the economic uh, activities, not only for Asia, but also for the whole world. So uh, you can find if China and India combines or China and India, Japan and Korea, you find big chunk of uh, global GDP they have, big chunk of the market. No market will be bigger than the China and India market. So when it comes to the manufacturing, Vietnam is uh, coming very, uh, very strongly. And now earlier it used to be East Asian countries. Now these emerging countries are there. Okay. And then uh, among all these countries, you find that India is a, also a, a very important country in Asia with its size, potential, 
as well as a historical and cultural linkages uh, with almost all countries in uh, of Asia. You will find India almost uh, ha has a relationship and very most of the time cordial relationship with almost every country, except few exceptions, just like, for example, India and Pakistan, there is a, always a, a, a dispute uh, since the uh, uh, independence of, and the division of both countries. But uh, after, the, uh, apart from that, except a few hiccups, India has more or less maintained uh, a relationship with almost every country. Of course, when two countries uh, live together, there will be some sort of differences, but differences and uh, 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 the divergence uh, never had the, ha, have become the uh, barricade or barrier uh, in cooperating uh, with each other. In fact, we still cooperate with, um, uh, in spite of so many differences. Uh, so India, uh, for example, uh, again, I give you the example of Korea. India has a relationship both with both Korea, as both Koreas, South Korea as well as North Korea. India also, despite of uh, some internal politics, uh, regional politics, uh, which created uh, misperception even in Sri Lanka, still it has maintained a very cordial and uh, uh, relationship with Sri Lanka. The same goes with uh, many other Middle East countries. So. Uh, you find that India has tried its best to maintain uh, the relations because India comes with a view that most of the countries in Asia, somewhere, with the, uh, the victims of uh, victims of the colonialism. So we share the common plight. So it, if you say I say India with Asia, it is not only confined to Asia. In the same in India's relation with many African countries. So in spite of geographically very far they find the common uh, 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 common sink or common relation or the common chemistry between each other. Yes, we were the victims of, uh, uh, of the colonialism. Okay. Now, historical linkages between uh, uh, India and the um, other parts of Asia, where especially uh, I say religious linkage. So India is the birthplace of several religions. As such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Jainism, etc., you, you find. Or, as well as India has been uh, the, the home for many other religions which don't uh, uh, start, uh, uh, started in other parts of the world, but got a lot of nurture in, the, in India, for example, Islam. Uh, so, of all the religions which uh, originate uh, in, or nurtured in India, Buddhism became uh, the central pillar for its linkages with several Asian countries. Now, uh, starting from India, so there is a, always a debate also when it comes to India and Nepal relation. So, of course, in the geographical term, in the modern uh, uh, geography, if we go by the Westphalian idea, so uh, Lumbini, of course, it is in, in Nepal. And Buddha was born in Lumbini, so presently it is in Nepal. But when it comes to Buddha and Buddhism, difference is there. What? So Buddhism started from India because after Ashoka uh, war, that um, I, I guess most of the Sri Lankans uh, uh, know this uh, all, all facts. So and then the Enlightenment uh, and uh, Buddha uh, Ashoka asked his uh, uh, people to spread uh, Buddhism. And the uh, uh, message of peace. So, and uh, Buddhist, uh, I am coming from uh, my home state is Bihar, and where uh, uh, Gaya is. So you can find that the uh, the, uh, the Bodhi was uh, Bodhi tree is also there. So Buddha got enlightenment, their education. So and Buddhism started to flourish, starting from India to uh, to Sri Lanka to uh, to China to many of the Southeast Asian countries, and then uh, reaching towards uh, Korea as well as Japan. So even uh, when I was, uh, I'm, why I'm mentioning about uh, something more about Korea, because one is like, of course, my relationship with Korea and live there and my major, but other also uh, very common, common things I'm trying to bring, not only focused on India and Korea. So many Koreans used to say, India is a country at least once in a lifetime we have to visit because 
even though Korea is changing and uh, a lot of uh, Christianity uh, has uh, uh, people, uh, Christian people are there, but still they say, yes, historically we were very close thanks to the uh, uh, religion called uh, Buddhism. Now, all the, uh, Islam, as I mentioned, although it uh, appeared in the other part of the world, but uh, it, it didn't originate in India, it has the second largest Muslim population in the world, connecting fine tuning with the Middle East. So in Indonesia is number one and India is number two in uh, having Muslim population. And which also helps, uh, it's a diverse population also helps to uh, forge uh, very close relation with countries which uh, are uh, geographically very far from India. So uh, you find that the uh, Arab countries like Saudi Arabia or United Arab Emirates or Oman and many other countries, recently they have started to build a lot of rela uh, uh, good relations and uh, developmental projects with India. Okay, civilizational relation. India shares common civilization with its neighbors as well as uh, uh, countries which are not bordered such as uh, Iran or Korea. For example, Sri Lanka and India, that's a uh, very common civilization or Nepal or Bangladesh, although divided in uh, 1971, but ancestry, we, we see very common civilization. Then uh, uh, India and Myanmar, uh, this, all these things, civilizational relation is there, or Bhutan is there, or even India and Pakistan, they're very common. You find in spite of the differences in our relationship, people enjoy watching Bollywood movies. That's a uh, very commonality is there. It's not that Hollywood is uh, not uh, good. Hollywood is always there and a, very, uh, a big market. But like, in fact, these people try to find very common relations, commonality between these two uh, countries and, or the culture. India and Iran, civilizational relation, or even the myth in Korea. In Korea, uh, you might have heard about the Korean names like Kim. So uh, there is a myth called uh, one Indian princess uh, Huang Ho, she went to Korea uh, in, in the 6th or 7th century, uh, I think 5th or 6th century, and then he married Kim Suro of the Khaya dynasty, and, uh, and uh, she had uh, 12 kids. Out of 12 kids, 12 got the surname Kim. Now, in Korea, you find that if you, someday if you go, you will say that there are 20, several clans of Kims, but the most important Kim is Khaya King. Kayakim, which is related with India. So in a, uh, uh, if in a sense of humor, uh, we can say that 60% uh, uh, of the Kims are actually coming from India. Well, that's a different story. So you find that different civilizational relation is there. Hmm? Then the civilizational relation also comes with the food. Of course, we Indians uh, uh, claim that tandoori chicken or Tandoori naan or samosa, these all uh, are coming from India. But if we try to dissect and uh, go, uh, 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 and if we try to uh, go deeper in the history, we find that actually tandoori chicken is, or naan is coming from Uzbekistan, are coming from Uzbekistan. Samosa is coming from Persia. So now even Uzbekistan didn't care, okay, tandoori, because they don't eat this type of food like tandoori chicken. They have different type of tandoori, tandoori food or the Iran's, they are not eating samosa. And we claim to be, it is the uh, samosa or this uh, tandoori chicken or naan, they have originated in India. But how this cultural uh, amalgamation ha have taken place be uh, between India and several other countries. This, uh, 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 then after that, um, uh, many uh, countries language has its roots in Indo-Aryan language and many traces to uh, Sanskrit, the oldest uh, written language in the world. For example, even the Sri Lankan uh, language, Sinhali, if I'm not wrong. So they used Brahmani uh, script and uh, uh, very much connected to Sanskrit. In fact, uh, um, I was trying to add uh, one slide, but I just, uh, I thought that it uh, may get uh, uh, distracted, but I found that uh, even some of the language, for example, uh, in, uh, in the Sinhali language, uh, 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 people say power uh, to father and pitre uh, to, uh, in Sanskrit. And uh, pit, uh, in Latin, it is pater 
and uh, in uh, in spanish it is padre and english it is father so how very much connected the language so we sometimes we say indo european language indo aryan language so the language also has uh, uh, become uh, has been the uh, connecting link between india and several uh, asian countries also if you see the national uh, uh, carrier of indonesia uh, the uh, uh, airlines of indonesia it is garuda so you find that oh in so much like garuda is again the sanskrit word so uh, indo aryan language also uh, uh, is a very much connecting link between india and many asian countries it is not only the religion not only the food but also the language so three basic aspects that india connects uh, with several asian countries okay india and the world so and now we are uh, we have uh, had uh, we had a short introduction uh, the idea of historical linkages now we are going uh, to the contemporary part is so how india is doing with many asian countries in its relationship so we will see during the cold war uh, uh, years uh, india's international relations swung between an idealist posture often associated with uh, country's first prime minister jawaharlal nehru and a hard aired age pragmatic realist favored by indira gandhi no now now you see in, in nehru was very much influenced by gandhi so very much idealist unfortunately the world is system or the international system is not very idealist so that and that was the case and india suffered uh, because of those type of uh, uh, those idealist ideas Uh, especially uh, when uh, it could have captured uh, uh, with its military force the uh, the whole of kashmir but like it went to united nations where uh, united nations instead of favoring uh, india they took different position so the uh, set back to nehru's idealism or to uh, china war that also happened in, uh, later in the 1960s uh, 1962 indira gandhi was very much different Uh, realism that country's uh, interest uh, and matters and for that it can also go to war so that uh, things over the period it changed now above all india's uh, international uh, here asian profile was identified with non alignment with uh, in the cold war and solidarity with still uh, colonized or newly decolonized countries and more broadly with the plight of developing countries of course india tried to avoid going with uh, uh, what we say uh, the uh, us bloc the western bloc or the soviet union bloc the communist bloc because india was also in the 1957 47 was a very nascent uh, in, in independent country it has its own set of problems and if it alliance with, uh, uh, allied with this uh, uh, united soviet union will uh, uh, will be upset and then it india has to bear the ire or the anger of soviet union so instead of joining in a bloc india uh, uh, focused more on uh, what we say uh, the, the non aligned movement so we are not aligned with any other countries and try to find a commonalities between india and uh, the newly uh, decolonized countries in the west india was often described as too much moralistic and hypocritical so the western countries many times especially united states was not very happy uh, with the uh, uh, with india uh, stand because it was not uh, nehru was not uh, taking open stance or open uh, uh, stance uh, uh, siding with uh, united states it was very much a moral that uh, uh, united states uh, should do this or should do that in fact even in the korean war india was the chairman a uh, post korean war india was the chair uh, chairman uh, india had the chairmanship of temporary uh, united nations uh, uh, temporary committee on korea and in, in india often used to uh, give the ideas which were not liked by the western countries so india had uh, people they used to say india is too much moralistic and very difficult to uh, work with uh, with, uh, with them okay and hypocritical in the sense that the western countries used to make fun of india like if that is the can they what 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 about the india's uh, stance in the kashmir and other areas india's rhetoric obscured hard realities from indian eyes in fact what nehru or the uh, india of that time thought like a, a very idealistic india 
it didn't help the world system is very different and it, there was a traumatic war with china in 1962 and i and sometimes even exhausting india's friends like uh, so india was a loss of big uh, friends especially from big powers so which uh, which could help uh, india and post 1962 india realized the realities of world politics and started to look some other big countries for its own help India and the world, India's enthusiasm for participation in and shaping regional po political security arrangements is relatively new. If you see like uh, India uh, and regionalism that I will uh, explain later also, it's uh, not too much. In fact, most, most of the time it focused only on NAN and that uh, non aligned movement that gave the stage, uh, that gave us a, a, a stage to India uh, to express itself and uh, to, uh, uh, to forward its ideas and, uh, and goals. The foreign policy is a witness in the early Cold War, it generated deep suspicion in, in some Western quarters that India might emerge as successor of Japan's Asiatic imperialism. These fears turned out to be exaggerated. Of course, India was not interested because Nehru uh, uh, was very much against those uh, imperialism or uh, 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 imperialistic ideas. But as the way uh, India was preaching or giving the, uh, the, uh, the views uh, very openly and sometimes very much against the Western countries, uh, Western countries sometimes uh, viewed uh, India uh, maybe like the, uh, just, uh, will behave, uh, would behave just like Japan. The enduring consequence of the subsequent partitions and the conflict with China over Tibet and the boundary tied uh, down India to dealing with conflicts within its own neighborhood. So for, uh, India realized that the moralistic politics hardly works in the world politics and uh, it had to struggle and, uh, uh, with its own neighborhood uh, uh, issues. India and the world. Although India's third world activism meant taking position on global issues, these degenerated into mere posturing against one or both superpowers and the inability to come to the uh, to the aid of friendly nations in conflict with their neighbors so of course uh, through this non aligned movement india got the platform to speak against this uh, either soviet union or the united states or many other european countries but it was just a mere speech what what uh, uh, it's just like intangible when it comes to tangibility India hardly had to offer anything, had anything to offer. Why, why so? Because India was already uh, struggling in its, uh, with its own issues, poverty, uh, underdevelopment, and all these things. How it, can help, uh, it could help other countries, uh, other Asian countries, for example. Even India gave preachings to Vietnam, uh, America and uh, uh, spoke uh, against the United States in the Vietnam War. But <coughs> Did India had any uh, any solution to Vietnam War, Vietnam issue? No, just criticism. So India hardly mattered when it uh, comes to the real politics uh, in in uh, joining this Asian community in in the, in the early days. When India took, uh, for example, bold position as in Indochina in support of uh, uh, Vietnamese in, in, in intervention in Cambodia or criticizing American war in Vietnam or supporting Sri Lankan government in its own fight against LGTE, it put New Delhi at odds with, with all the great powers as well as back home, other than the Soviet Union and ASEAN. So uh, 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 we can, we can uh, see that it had its own problem and uh, 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 when it took uh, 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 this, uh, its open stand against the United States in Vietnam. In fact, uh, one American soldier uh, said that India is still importing wheat uh, from the uh, United States and is still asking money from the United States. And then India also preached United States what to do and what not to do. So they say India is very hypocritic sometimes. Or uh, when it comes to uh, the Sri Lankan government, uh, against when the Rajiv Gandhi uh, supported uh, Sri Lankan government in its fight against LTT, then it, uh, he had to sacrifice his life. And uh, that happened uh, uh, in India. Um, uh, and he, he died in the terrorist uh, attack. Or 
sometimes Asia, uh, uh, it, yes, Soviet Union was not very uh, uh, upset with India because India also uh, went uh, with the, the socialist policies. And later with the NAMP, most of the time it was unofficially allied with the Soviet Union. And also some uh, ASEAN countries because we had the commonalities and uh, 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 not very much anti-West, but a different feeling of, I, 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 as I said, colonialism. So it was there, so it uh, had its com uh, com uh, uh, it has its commonalities, which helped India uh, not to be at odds with ASEAN countries or Soviet Union or even the, its neighborhood, but like a, uh, in, uh, in the tangible terms, it was not enough. India's view on uh, regional integration. India is today a member of, uh, you can say, several trans-regional, regional, sub-regional groupings. As India rises, there is a recognition that its own interests, it needs to consider the wider regional as well as global interests. So India, uh, you, today you'll find India is a member of uh, not only uh, this uh, SAR cooperation, Southeast Asia is a region where despite the existence of pan-South uh, Asian uh, organization, SARC, uh, for three decades, it is yet to implement a single SAR project. So, uh, of course, we have this SARC, but like it is very uh, underdeveloped when we see uh, the European Union or when we see ASEAN um, uh, regional bloc. So, in that terms, uh, uh, although India is a member of SARC, it is a member of uh, ASEAN plus three plus three, uh, that is ASEAN plus three is China, Japan, Korea, and plus three, Australia, India, uh, and New Zealand. So India is also a member of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO. India is a member of several uh, uh, regional organizations or East Asia Summit. But like uh, when it comes to what India can offer, that is uh, the main concern instead of just uh, giving the speech that we will see later. So uh, now this was uh, a, a bit of like introduction, the ideas what India uh, 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 was and uh, the, uh, the reality of the Asian, uh, Asian uh, continent, uh, the, the politics, uh, India's own uh, limitations and uh, what India had done until now. Now we will go uh, for more explanation. What is multi uh, multi multilateralism? So, uh, a group of three or more than three group. That is uh, uh, called multilateralism. That's the basic idea. So when we say SARC countries, when we say ASEAN, when we say EU, when we say SCO, so many uh, different organization or uh, so uh, these all are multilater multilateral forums. India's view on multilateralism, we will see its impact on foreign policy. India's policy from non-alignment to multi-alignment minus alliance. That we will also see how India is uh, formulating its policies uh, or as well as uh, or strategies to build very closer network or closer relationship almost with almost all every Asian countries. And which in some way are uh, uh, bringing countries together on a common platform to have that Asian uh, unity, if not at, uh, unity, then at least Asian cooperation. Historical views on a, a, a multilateralism. As I mentioned, India's enthusiasm for participating in and shaping regional po uh, uh, political and security arrangements is relatively new. Uh, after its disappointment, it's trying to build Asian unity and solidarity in the 1950s. India's political emphasis um, this is turned global and multilateral. So India uh, earlier, it was not interested. Of course, it uh, helped, uh, it, it participated and, and uh, it um, supported this, the formation of United Nations. But like uh, it also found that it is a, a group of like most of the Western, Western countries. And uh, so it, uh, there, there was a kind of disenchantment enchantment, uh, with the, uh, the United Nations, some of the policies. And until now, India is still uh, not very happy because the United Nations is not seeing the changed global reality. And the presumed leadership of non-alignment gave India a stage to articulate. India, especially uh, its first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, was very much interested in the leadership, if not at the global level, at least at the uh, regional level. So because India, uh, he or you can say through him, India always uh, uh, inspired or uh, uh, was interested to have its uh, leadership 
not in the imperialistic or colonial term, but actually uh, forwarding the goals of other countries. So a kind of like a leadership in a very positive and cooperative term. Dilemma over liberal, uh, historical views of in India's multilateralism. Dilemma over multilateralism and liberal internationalism. So uh, whether India was a socialist country, so whether to go with this uh, uh, liberal internationalism where it has to open its market, it had its fear that then the Western countries will come. What happened with uh, in India before the uh, East India Company and then started this uh, the Indian colonization or the multilateralism that's like the United Nation. And so it was like in the thought that India thought that it is a group, although India can become the member or the part of the, uh, that group, but still the Western countries will uh, uh, dictate or regulate those organizations. Kashmir issue and West tilting towards Pakistan put India's interest in multilateralism in back burner. In fact, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when India took this uh, uh, issue of Kashmir, uh, then uh, uh, United Nations as well as the Western countries, they instead of uh, saying what was wrong, but uh, instead they said that, yes, everyone should stop the war. And uh, without mentioning Pakistan, they said that we will decide, uh, we will decide later. So that was a setback to India. India took the case to United Nations, but the United Nations didn't, uh, give, uh, uh, didn't give any positive uh, answer to India's case. SATO, Southeast Asian, uh, Asia Treaty Organization or Central Treaty Organization made watershed uh, uh, in India's overture to um, uh, multilateralism. But again, these were all very, very uh, nascent or it evaporated before even uh, seeing uh, their blo uh, blooming days uh, in those times. Nehru's, um, then the why in multilateralism? Again, then the problem was Nehru romanticism with socialism put India against economic multilateralism because economic multilateralism uh, you find especially in the European countries, uh, EU countries, and before EU also many in the Western countries were very much on the market economy and uh, India was very much in, uh, influenced by socialism. Uh, so uh, very much uh, against this uh, economic multi multilateralism. So that also didn't help India uh, in, in that terms. So uh, to, uh, to come uh, out uh, of its, uh, uh, to, uh, to join any multilateral forum. The inward looking India uh, put India marginal to the dynamics of Asia. So if India is not developed, India's economy is not developed, India's security is not developed, it is also still dependent on many other countries, how India can offer to other countries to help, which I mentioned in the previous uh, slides. So that was an issue. So India has its dilemma, uh, political leadership has a dilemma to join liberal internationalism or multilateralism, or uh, if not, what to do? Having socialism, but the economy is not uh, developing, and then uh, just confine itself in, in itself. So just uh, giving a mere speech, but in terms of reality, it is not offering anything. At the height of Cold War, India redefined this uh, uh, non-aligned movement and equal partnership between North and South under the framework of G77. That's the uh, non-aligned movement countries. Most of the time, the Asians, uh, Africans, uh, African countries, and some uh, uh, Latin America, so these were the countries uh, which were part of like uh, 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 mostly Asia and uh, Africa, uh, part of G77, but hardly any 77 countries matter in the real, in, in the, uh, in the real term politics during that time. Formation of SARC with socialism as defining people. So there was no real prospect like in, the, in, in terms of economy, if I mention. So it was very difficult uh, to, uh, for India to uh, just to forward its goal, Asian unity or Asian cooper uh, cooperation, uh, helping other countries uh, in, in real terms. At the uh, late 1990s, in economic, in uh, uh, when, uh, the, uh, the Cold War at the sunset of Cold War, better uh, we can say, late 1990s, economic crisis, success of regional organizations, supplemented by its own economic reforms, 
made India to rediscover uh, importance of economic multilateralism. So the 1990 was a very difficult time uh, for India because uh, so the uh, it was the collapse of Soviet Union, which was um, uh, if I if I'm, uh, if I say a backbone if a backbone may be wrong, but like uh, Soviet Union was helping India a lot in terms of economy, diplomacy, as well as influence on Indian politics, like communism or socialism here in India. So many factors were there, but with the demise of Soviet Union, the demise of all the East European communist countries, India was left with no one to but to look itself and what to get help from other countries. Like how to get help from other countries because it's huge population economy was not developed, very much socialist. So India opened its market and that was the time of globalization, the dawn of globalization in 1990. And India started to move away from socialist economy to market economy. Recognizing the importance of external finance and uh, India launched Lukist policy and gradually became uh, the active partner of ASEAN. For example, uh, India saw uh, uh, these ASEAN countries have uh, uh, developed even in many aspects more than India. And India realized that even though ASEAN countries uh, or even uh, countries like Korea, uh, uh, they, we got independence almost at the same time. For example, uh, uh, just like in the uh, uh, mid 1940s to uh, uh, early 1950s. But most of the countries have developed their economy and India is lagging behind. So India realized that there, is a, uh, there was a problem in our, uh, in our own policy. And India started saying that uh, we have looked a lot on West or uh, to our West here means also uh, uh, West as well as Soviet Union. It is time to look towards East and learn from these East countries, Eastern countries. The, so India, Eastern means not only Japan, not, not Japan and Korea, but especially the ASEAN countries, how these countries, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, they have uh, really uh, developed their economy. Then uh, China's uh, economic initiative in the early 90s and India's cold uh, response due to China's hidden support of uh, insurgencies in the northeast of India. So China was also starting to develop its own regionalism and economic initiative and which was uh, very much on the borders of India. So India realized that it cannot be aloof to all these uh, changing uh, geopolitics uh, politics realities. And uh, India started uh, uh, fo uh, focusing on to become the part of, uh, how to become the part of different regional organization, as well as developing its economy. With uh, Chinese uh, more averages, India started its own uh, and well Mekong Ganga initiative. That was Myanmar, Cambodia, Thailand, and Vietnam in counter to those uh, uh, Chinese uh, regional uh, activism or, uh, activism or regional, uh, uh, regional groupings. So uh, India thought it as a threat and India started uh, making this type of uh, regional organizations. Post Cold War, post 1990, sensing the importance of economic cooperation, which India was very much anti uh, in the uh, early, uh, early early 50s, 60s, 70s, until the Cold War, by looking at the success of EU and ASEAN, India uh, began to, uh, to press for greater economic co cooperation within the subcontinent by re-energizing re SARC at the end of 1990s, supporting the F idea of free trade agreement, FTA, in the region, but not much success. In fact, if we see SARC, Many times it is uh, 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 it hardly had uh, anything to offer in real uh, in big terms when we see the uh, uh, success of regional organizations such as EU and ASEAN. Although uh, these uh, uh, SARC countries are uh, very much uh, similar and very much uh, uh, historical linkages, cultural linkages, uh, uh, many things are very uh, uh, similar, but it is still. We have uh, uh, differences and differences, for example, India, Pakistan always become a bone of contention um, oh, no when it comes to South country. Okay. 
So, yeah, so uh, when it comes to... Sir, uh, excuse yes? me, Hemanta is here. Shall we yes. give a five-minute break for the students? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Then, uh, time is 3.50. Shall we start uh, around, say, 3.55? Yes, sir. It is... Yes. Uh, for a clock. We can give 10 minute break. Yes. Okay. Okay. Then our students, uh, please take a break and we are going to start now 3.51, uh, 4 p.m. Okay, right. May I start? Yeah, yeah, of course, please. Okay. So uh, coming back, uh, welcome, uh, welcome back once again. So uh, the post-Cold War, uh, that uh, we were discussing that the supporting India started supporting the idea of uh, free trade uh, agreement and in the region, but not uh, very much success because India, of course, changed from its socialist economy looking toward, uh, towards the regional cooperation, but it was still in the very nascent stage. ASEAN became the principal vehicle for Asia's regionalism that any country, not only India, Many countries can say that, of course, we formed SARC. Middle East countries had the Gulf, GCC, Gulf uh, countries cooperation, uh, many other countries. But ASEAN, uh, of course, comes at, at the forefront uh, and become the, uh, became the vehicle uh, of Asia's regionalism. Uh, liberalization and the rise of its economy gave a new thirst uh, to its economy. And it's also it's important, which resulted in signing of free trade agreement or SEPA, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement with ASEAN countries. Then from ASEAN, India expanded further and uh, the, uh, its policy towards East, geographically and politically, Australia, Japan, and South Korea. So in the 90s, India uh, started expanding its relationship with many other countries. With the change of uh, world dynamics uh, in the post 1990s, multilateralism and regional security cooperation emerged at the top of Indian uh, foreign policy. So you, we can see that India started looking on all this cooperation, multilateral or the Asian uh, cooperation post 1990s, because it started getting results of the economic uh, cooperation where India started getting investments from many countries and those countries started getting Indian market. So, and then the security aspect also becoming uh, very much uh, 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 in the part of those uh, negotiations. Not to be left behind, India vigorously uh, started in its campaign uh, uh, with covert support of Japan uh, and strong support from Indonesia, Vietnam, and Singapore ASEAN invited India in the first East Asia summit, even though China strongly opposed it. So because these countries, Japan, uh, Japan Indonesia, they were very much uh, uh, interested to have India as a partner in, and the unfortunate uh, 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 thing was, India was always shy of this type of engagements. So India gave up its shyness and started cooperating with these countries. And for, uh, of course, these countries started supporting India uh, strongly. Debates in India's, uh, on India's regionalism. Idea of uh, uh, formation of Asian bloc in the post decolonization with different uh, uh, views supplemented with suspicions. So a kind of like Asian bloc, it was a kind of, you know, uh, many countries, they fear that a kind of neo-colonialist uh, colonial idea or something like that, including India. So India's independent India's must, uh, uh, I, I give you one example, uh, independent India must remain at the center of any Western strategy to secure Asia. So many countries were also shy from India when, when it, it sees the world reality because India making this relation and Western countries idea about India was that, so we keep the India intact with us and then uh, focus on the how to control the Asia. Now, if India at the forefront, many countries might um, uh, at that time might be shying about uh, getting close with India. So, and then the, the uh, six, uh, post 1960s, the realist politics started, emergence of India's uh, realist school, rejecting the pacifist views and focusing on state security. So that means giving up the idea of Nehru's idealism and more on the uh, realistic politics, pragmatic politics, which, uh, uh, which started helping the India's, uh, as well as shaping the India's foreign policy. 
India China love it relationship under the smog of Tibet issue. Finally, to cope with the new situation of uh, the policy of simultaneous engagement and containment due to border issue that I have explained all these things uh, earlier. So these are the views of India's regionalism. A new chapter in India foreign policy with the starting of a, a strategic relations with Moscow, simply supporting Vietnam in Cambodia, bad experience demands. So why suddenly these things happen? The, the, uh, when we see with the debates on Indian regionalism, bad experience demand change, good uh, supports sustain. So India's own shyness, own uh, in, in, in inability uh, made India uh, 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 had the bad experience uh, which demanded India to change its policies and uh, look for diff, uh, different style of, uh, style of foreign policies. Transforming from, uh, from the idea of leading to the idea of immunity, India's 19th economic uh, crisis. For example, Nehru always had the idea or India always had in the 1950s had the idea to lead Asia. But India was nowhere to lead Asia because even a small country, geographically small countries like Japan and Korea, they are much more stronger in terms of economy. They are helping many other countries, uh, including India, Sri Lanka, many, and many other countries. So India gave up this idea of having the leadership and how to learn from those countries, emulating or the, uh, especially in terms of economy, how they have uh, developed their economy and implement those ideas back home, as well as if it is successful, also to spread those ideas in other parts of the world. Changing the shape of socialist mixed protected economy to capitalist mixed protected economy. Although India has changed by, uh, in terms of economy, but still uh, many countries, they say India is still a protected economy. Being one of the NAM, uh, uh, members of NAM, which has uh, so, uh, foreign policy till the 80s, and is still, the, uh, although NAM is still there, it is losing its shine. Now you see almost every country is today uh, collaborating or cooperating with United States as well as Russia or with uh, many Western countries as well as Eastern countries. So there is hardly any block in the present, uh, in the contemporary uh, period, the, unlike in the, it was in the Cold War. India was all strongly against uh, uh, alliance, uh, uh, any alliance and more against the use, but still India used uh, NAM. Why? to have its own uh, autonomy. Once you are in alliance, once any state is in alliance, then uh, alliance often, it's not the written rule, but alliance often happens between big power and a small power. And big power always has the final, uh, 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 final saying. So that's, that uh, 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 creates a problem in the relationship. So that's why in spite of uh, NAM is losing the, its sign, India still uh, want to have this NAM, at least on paper. Why opposed to US in the idea? Uh, because US alliance included, included India's adversary, Pakistan. So NAM was a code word for independent foreign policy. In fact, uh, recently India, uh, Australia, uh, Japan, and United States, they formed Quad uh, because of the rising uh, Chinese aggressive behavior. But still, India said we will not have a kind of like alliance system. Cooperation always uh, welcome. Alliance system, India may be uh, uh, uncomfortable to sit in those alliance uh, grouping. Unfolding structural changes in the world politics and the Asian balance of power, India US came uh, close at the 21st century under Bush Manmohan regime. Joint co uh, coalition uh, operations in tsunami and military framework uh, agreement. So you will see that India's cooperation now, uh, when its economy was uh, strong, India also helped. Of course, it helped itself, uh, especially in, in the tsunami. It also helped uh, uh, its own experiences and sh uh, share the pains of Sri Lanka in the time of tsunami or the earthquake in in. in, uh, in uh, in, in, in Nepal, and so many uh, natural calamities, India started uh, 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 working together with many uh, other Asian countries, uh, finding the common uh, uh, commonalities and how to uh, uh, cooperate in the uh, uh, with many other Asian countries. However, both uh, 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 the problem is that unlike US, India is still uh, hesitate 
to take very open against uh, 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 open stance against china because in spite of a lot of differences recently if we see that this, this year also india is still uh, because you cannot have a peaceful environment a peaceful uh, a peaceful development when you have a very uh, uh, difficult neighborhood uh, so india wants to have in spite of all the uh, problems with china not to have a very bad relation with uh, china so nevertheless uh, uh, so both uh, were not in favor of antagonizing china nevertheless find deeper bilateral cooperation uh, like uh, 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 in, in terms of security two proposition of this relationship can be taken from the indian perspective to merge as an indispensable asian element in asian balance of power given its history and location so india if you if we see asia almost at the center of the whole asian countries and with its size with its military with its rising economy it is uh, it cannot be ignored strategically cooperation with the us might immensely strengthen india's future options because india realized that soviet union or russia is no more powerful and it also needs a lot of economic benefits japan and korea also are aligned with um, uh, with united states and so are the many western countries so in terms of having technologies or economic support india needs the, uh, the support uh, help of these countries so having a good relation with united states at the end of the day realize it helps in, uh, will, would help india to realize asian cooperation uh, in, in indian perspective so india towards south asia we see uh, uh the term like sark came but like it is just in paper we see like seven uh, 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 seven eight countries but like uh, you find that india and pakistan always in a very difficult uh, relationship so even there is sark summit in uh, uh, india of course work more towards southeast asia asean when it compared to the sark although uh, india says or many other countries wants um, uh, to have this uh, 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 as our uh, unity very strong but a lot of differences are there so that's a big issue how to uh, make sark as strong as asean india towards east india has taken a deeper interest in east asia over the last decade as it tries to define its new global uh, role although as i mentioned about the lookist policy when it opened in the market now india has changed from lookist policy Uh, that i didn't mention i forgot uh, actist policy so the lookist policy was more on economy but the economy if the if uh, the relationship is only based on economy then it is not very strong but when it comes also to security then the relationship also becomes very strong so india's actist policy has also found the uh, the elements of uh, security where japan is also cooperating korea is also cooperating indonesia is also cooperating in many uh, other aspects uh, under this policy india initiated economic and commercial ties as well as security partnership that i mentioned like minded countries who are concerned with the increasing influence uh, of china in the region like uh, uh, we will see later also uh, how china uh, of course its uh, uh, loans to many other countries has created bad loans and had become a part of like debt diplomacy which uh, has created problem for many other countries recently myanmar stopped chinese investment in the dam project so uh, these are the many aspects that india and many other asian countries found the co- uh, commonalities and started to progress uh, together not only india and asean but also uh, as i mentioned asean plus 3 and plus 3 so many asian countries uh, started cooperating uh, with india since the last decade security has become a, a, a become a major part of india's uh, lookist policy wherein it included uh, concluded defense uh, agreement with uh, singapore in 2003 recently it has uh, done with korea also uh, it has done, uh, now it is working with japan also even with vietnam india is start, uh, cooperating and they are doing naval exercises so many other countries are doing this military cooperations and military exercise with uh, 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 with india in the region as the power balance is moving uh, from western hemisphere to asia pacific region where in the rise of china and the us uh, uh, pivot to asia 
have become a central piece of debate in foreign policy of several countries. New Delhi has crafted its foreign policy to stay abreast of the rapid development. For example, in these days, you find it's not only Trump or China, US or China. Many countries are concerned about the rise of China. Rise of China is uh, uh, many countries welcome, but the rise of China plus its aggressive behavior had uh, had, had uh, created ripples in many countries. For example, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, Philippines. Japan, Korea, Bhutan, uh, India, even Nepal, uh, uh, just a few months ago, India, uh, Nepal was very much getting close with uh, uh, China. Now it is realizing its own uh, troubles with China in the territorial issues. So many countries have found the commonalities and with the support of US, like the, how to have the common points and cooperate, uh, uh, um, which is sustainable. Uh, for everyone and which doesn't hurt any country's interest. From lookist, as I mentioned, to actist, uh, 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 India in 2014 recrafted uh, lookist policies to actist policies, engaging both in the economic as well as security perspective. The rise of China and its assertive behavior has posed a new challenge to whole world in Asia, uh, and Asia in particular. So uh, you, as I mentioned, uh, uh, named a few countries, these countries are, are, are uh, also in uh, 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 com conflict with China, border issue with almost every country, starting from India to Bhutan, to Southeast Asian countries such as Vietnam, Philippines, Korea, and Japan. And every country has its dispute and where uh, China is claiming its own territory. Many of the countries, for example, uh, China claims its territory from the um, uh, uh, Qing Dynasty perspective. But like, uh, if that is the perspective, then uh, in the contemporary time, India can also claim that Afghanistan, it used to be part of India in the ancient perspective. But we have to look everything from the contemporary time, not from the, uh, from what you say, we say uh, the ancient times. Many countries in the, in the Asia Pacific region shares, uh, uh, share New Delhi's concern about Chinese growing assertiveness, including ASEAN uh, countries. That's why ASEAN is always inviting India and to be partner uh, in many uh, uh, dialogues where China is all, also there because some of the ASEAN countries are very uh, weak, so uh, uh, find it difficult to, to counter China. So and uh, so they want ASEAN, uh, India as well as Japan and Australia to have this uh, these countries together and cooperate each other with each other. One of the best example was recently APEC summit. Although India is not part of APEC and is trying its best to become the member, but maybe in the future, uh, 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 fail, uh, where first time uh, fail to uh, agree on a communique because um, um, uh, like, for example, some countries like Cambodia and Malaysia, they were not uh, very much uh, taking open uh, 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 agreement uh, against China, but other countries were. So finally, uh, it, it didn't happen. Actually, that was the first time uh, that happened. Uh, uh, in the uh, summit. Now you see China factory in India's activist strategy. China's policies, one built one road, is new uh, is now viewed as debt trap diplomacy. Many countries are going against it. For example, if you see the countries like Djibouti, Kyrgyzstan, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Pakistan, Maldives, Laos, Fiji, and uh, except uh, Pakistan, many countries are feeling the uh, the, uh, the problems which is coming out of uh, Chinese a foreign loan, which is more expensive than even Japanese loan, than even Korean loan, than even Asian Development Bank loan, or even World Bank loan. So you'll find that that, that uh, 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 the debt uh, loan is not coming at on easy terms, and it is uh, creating a problem. But like count saying only China uh, and its debt diplomacy will not uh, work because unless India or other countries uh, give other uh, uh, counter uh, uh, idea how to have a development. China's economic inducement is viewed as seeking to buy influence. For example, even Malaysia, uh, 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 which uh, for, uh, in the few years, uh, last few years was supporting China, has shown that people are very much against uh, the electoral result that uh, Chinese debt trap uh, investments. So India's idea to China's one built one road is 
many roads and many uh, uh, many belts and many roads. Uh, sorry, uh, um, it's uh, MR, not MR, MR. It's M MBMR. That's my idea. So many belts and many roads. It cannot be one belt, one road. It's better to China's one belt, one road, which is often working as problematic for many countries in the region and beyond. India, along with uh, Japan, has launched Asia Africa corridor, growth corridor, where Japan's money is coming, uh, money, uh, and India's historical uh, uh, relation with Africa, uh, which is helping. So both countries uh, are working together to help not only Asian countries, but also African countries. So Asia Africa growth corridor is a plan to create free and open Indo-Pacific region by focusing on ancient sea routes and uh, uh, Southeast Asia or uh, South Asia linkages. The project stakeholders uh, hope uh, the sea corridor will be low cost and other that's the, uh, that and that um, and have less carbon footprint uh, with, uh, when uh, compared to land corridor, which is very much on the one belt one road of China. Moreover, India has recently tried to galvanize its relation with ASEAN neighbors by trying to shed out differences with each other's expectations and uh, disillusionment. India's uh, 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 economic focus too, uh, too is not in tune with other, other regional powers like SARC, which view uh, also which view ASEAN as an important market for their exports and uh, investments. Finally, uh, we come to uh, uh, conclusion. As there are many common, common interests of mutual benefits, as well as common concerns, owing to the rise of assertive China, both India and Asian countries have to work together from a long-term uh, perspective, not from short term. Although earlier India, uh, interest of India was mostly confined to regional influences. In fact, even I, uh, 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 instead of regional influence, India was confined to itself that we have seen in the presentation. Uh, it has started to uh, look beyond, uh, to, uh, it's not only to express its growing stature, but also to counter China's influence in the region. India's need, uh, need India, India needs to make deeper commitment to Asian countries. Of course, India has to take care of the Asian countries' uh, 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 sensitivities, like what, what is very important in this part. But for example, during the Manmohan Singh government, that was very bad that India uh, voted against uh, Sri Lanka um, in the United Nations, and that uh, create uh, problems in the India-Sri Lanka relation because Sri Lanka was always historically, culturally, in many aspects, geographically, very close country. And India, because of regional politics, uh, they, they did uh, something wrong that India in the present government realized that these mistakes should be avoided. India is not seen uh, as a threat, unlike China, which is viewed with anxiety by many countries. However, own economic and strategic profile in the region in order to come by a viable uh, option of trade of mutual uh, benefit compared to China, which domestic country in exports with Asian countries. So India has to make itself a very strong economy um, and then uh, become a, a ray of hope for many other countries. Uh, because many countries, although concerns uh, have the concern with China, they do, don't find any other option. Both India and many Asian countries, Asian countries have historical and cultural linkages and hence both need to reinvigorate both those bondings. India should offer scholarships to Asian students to uh, premier engineering, medical and management institutions in order to boost people to people contact. That also help like uh, and create a very good environment uh, between those uh, uh, India and uh, uh, Asian countries and kind of like India's ways of cooperation. India and Asian countries have a special role to play in recon reconciling, fusing and amalgamating these different uh, processes. They stand between China on one side and US on the other ge uh, geopolitically. So, Asian countries have concern getting close with the US because of US some of the uh, um, uh, problems in US foreign policy, but they are also concerned with China. India lies in the middle, how India can become a ray of hope for these countries which don't want to be close, very close with China as well as the United States, that India has to find a very common uh, platform. They have uh, deep, uh, India and other uh, Asian countries have deep cultural, economic, and diplomatic links to both. Uh, I mean, like the US and China. They do not, uh, I'm sorry, India and the Asian countries. 
India and Asian, they don't treat uh, 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 each other. India is not regarded as a threat uh, as, uh, to Asian countries, and they are not threat to India. Hardly any threat, except a few uh, 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 bad policies from Indian side. Uh, but like most of the time, it is uh, still uh, seen as a very good neighbor, good friend. In this, uh, in this sense, they form what the political scientist uh, Karl Dodge uh, referred to as a security community, a relationship in which there is no fear to war. This security community could be forced uh, force for greater Asian integration in the years and decades ahead. So that type of India, if uh, policies uh, India uh, makes, then it will be a, a great contribution coming from India in the Asian cooperation and the, in the Asian integration. Thank you. Professor, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for sharing many important, uh, valuable thoughts and ideas. Actually, it was very, very, very interesting presentation. So now we can give, say, five, ten minutes for our students to ask questions. Students, if you have any questions, uh, if you need uh, more clarifications, so it's time. So it is your time, so you can ask uh, questions from uh, Professor Rahul Raj. Hello, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, because India is a member of the Nandanand movement, how does it impact other South Asian countries? Yes, India is a member. Uh, uh, India still believes in the Nandanand movement was the concept not to join a Asian um, American bloc or the US bloc, uh, Western countries, as well as the Soviet Union. But if we see uh, Nandanand is mostly on paper and uh, this Nandanand movement, even though it is uh, not very strong in, in the present days, it is still uh, helps many countries to have the autonomy in its foreign policy. So India, although it's part of a, 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 this Nandaland movement, but like India also is forging many close uh, partnership with other countries. So it hardly impacts uh, other countries because even those countries, they want to be part of, uh, they want to continue to be part of NAM, but on the, uh, on the other side, uh, on the side uh, is, they also want to make a relationship with uh, different countries. So Nandaland movement, it used to be like a, a grouping of not, uh, not to align with other. But so India's foreign policy has changed from Nandaland movement to say multi-alignment uh, multi movement. So make partnership with as many countries as possible. So it will, I, I guess it will hardly affect any other countries. Okay, so thank you. Any other questions, please? Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the great lecture. My uh, question is about India's uh, road to free trade. So uh, how do you think the Indian general public's attitudes uh, towards open trade and uh, regional integration have uh, changed since uh, pre-Cold War times to now? And uh, what do you think are the factors behind that change? Yes. Um, uh... One was that the India's own uh, reservation to, uh, I will uh, say it was a kind of prejudiced ideas, as well as its own uh, huge uh, influence uh, from socialism. So it was very much against the market economy. But when India realized uh, the country, especially the former prime minister of India, Vajpayee, uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, he said one, uh, uh, um, a very uh, beautiful line, I uh, quote, um, India doesn't want to sit with the Western developed countries. And no, uh, it doesn't have any interest, but India has to relook itself why India uh, is unable to sit with even those countries which got independence almost at the same, same time, but finding it difficult to sit with uh, them in terms of development. So there were some uh, problems in India's economic policy. So it's time for India to uh, re, uh, recheck its policies, which were and uh, more uh, going towards the trade agreement. Now comes the trade uh, issues uh, pre-Cold War to post-Cold War. India signed several uh, trade uh, uh, agreements and uh, post 1990s, as well as uh, it helped uh, uh, to boost trade with other countries, uh, 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 removing the trade barriers 
tariffs, taxes, but like also India realized that if, uh, one aspect is also is India's problem. India didn't develop uh, its own economy. Now India is again shy from signing a lot of free trade agreement, especially when it comes to Korea and Japan. Why? Because India uh, Indian products are not at par which can be accepted in Korea or Japan. And Japan and Korea very much develop. So they can, uh, they can sell their products a lot in India. So it creates a kind of trade, uh, uh, trade deficit. So India has a kind of like mixed uh, views, uh, uh, has mixed views on trade uh, pacts uh, or free trade agreement. So it is signing with some countries, but also it is uh, with reservation. And recently it didn't join a regional cooperation economic partnership and because it, it found that India is going to become a dumping ground for, uh, for many countries, especially it had concern with, uh, with China. So that's why uh, I, I, I would say that uh, free trade agreement is uh, necessary, but like uh, it should not be at the cost of your own deficit. So every country has to look its own uh, in, uh, strengths and weakness. And by uh, removing those, after removing those weakness, then countries can go for trade agreement, which will be mutually benefited, uh, benefit for each other instead of trade going to only one side because it creates a big trade de uh, deficit. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, if you don't mind, can you repeat the name of the gentleman who, uh you quoted about yeah, like India Atal, not Atal, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the former Prime Minister of India. Uh, he was right. Prime Minister from uh, 1998 to 2004. Okay, right. thank you, sir. Any other questions, please? No, right. Uh, so if you have any questions, so you can uh, send an email to our common email address, urakdu uh, at gmail.com. So, uh, Professor, one of our students is uh, waiting to deliver a vote of tank now. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of General Sir John Kotalavala Defence University. First, I would like to thank our guest lecturer, Professor Rahul Raj of Jawaharlal Nehru University, for delivering this lecture amid his busy schedule. Your address set the tone for this course by clearly indicating India's role in the Asian community and taught us a lot about our closest neighbor today, and we are blessed to have your contribution to our course. Next, I wish to thank <coughs> Dr. Hemanta Premaradna, who has taken great efforts to organize the lectures of this course. Thank you, sir. Our gratitude is also due to the staff and personnel of KDU involved in bringing these lectures together. Thank you. Last but not least, I thank all participants from our university for joining us today. Your participation has made this lecture a successful event, and I believe it has provided you with an insight into the Indian role in the Asian community. To conclude, let me reiterate my gratitude to to Professor Rahul Raj and you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you all.